Good afternoon in person and online participants. My name is Geoffrey Edwards, CIS coordinator. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge persons in our presence. Dr. Wilson, Shelian Wilson, head department of management studies. Mr. Roland Chevion, manager FIFA CIS International University Network. Ms. Shulan Cabrales, Director of the UE FIFA CIS, the Director of the UE FIFA CIS Postgraduate Diploma in Sports. And Ms. Kalisa Gregoire, UE Coordinator for the UE FIFA CIS Postgraduate Diploma in Sports. We welcome you to the Department of Management Studies Public Lecture Series hosted by the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Campus, the Center for Sports Studies, in collaboration with the FIFA. Today's insightful topic is entitled Sport Development and Design and Sport Development Programs. It will be presented by Global Citizen and Trinbagonian National, Mr. Nick Lau, who I must say has a, a riding crew with him of his family members who are here to support him. Thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs> Nick is an experienced sports industry professional with nearly 20 years of experience in sport, largely with FIFA and the FIFA World Cup. Nick has worked the areas of sport development and event management on projects ranging from grassroots level and the FIFA World Cup and spanning all continents. So guys, we have somebody for us, by us, speaking to us as regards to a very important topic. Nick has in-depth knowledge of FIFA World Cup bidding, planning, and operations, notably as the responsible for the administration of the several bidding process, including the 2018 and 2022 FIFA World Cup bidding process. In Trimbago, Alan's is a big one. Nick currently combines his various interests and fields of expertise at the Sport Impact Group, a not-for-profit association that he co-founded to bring together impact professionals and organizations for knowledge, sharing, and collaboration on projects that create impact with and through sport. Nick has completed his undergraduate studies in Harvard and went on to do the FIFA Masters in Sport Management with CIS. He currently resides in Zurich, Switzerland, but even being so far away, he still represents the red, white, and black, where he, he is a national athlete in cross country. I welcome a brother, a friend, Mr. Nick Lau. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the very kind words and introduction. I'd like to make a few acknowledgements as well from my side uh, before we get started. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, head of department of management programs, Ms. Sherlan Cabrales. Uh, oh, sorry, Ms. Dr. Shelley Ann Wilson. Um, the Director of Sport Management Programs, Ms. Sherilyn Cabrales, um, the Coordinator of Sports Management Programs, Ms. Calicia Gregoire, the CIS Coordinator in Trinidad and Tobago, and Fine Wordsmith, Mr. Jeffrey Edwards, uh, Mr. Roland Chavillon, uh, the CIS uh, Manager of the International University Network, and uh, as well, a uh, former lecturer here and um, a university network member and the coordinator from Brazil, Mr. Pedro Trengraus, who uh, has been an advocate for sports management education. Uh, 
also an inspiration and a dear friend. As we finish this round of um, acknowledgements, I feel that uh, there are two others that uh, need to be mentioned as far as the University of the West Indies is concerned. And uh, that those would be my parents who are both uh, alumni from this prestigious institution. My father studied in the Mona campus. He studied geology. And my mother studied here in St. Augustine, uh, agriculture and botany and plant pathology. So I would like to dedicate this presentation uh, to them in their honor. And I wish the students that um, your educational foundations be as strong as the rocks that my father studied and uh, that your careers blossom and grow like the plants that my mother studied here. Um, a few additional acknowledgements. I'd like to uh, recognize the presidents, uh, the presence of the Trinidad and Tobago Snow Sport Federation, of which I am an athlete, and the president, uh, Mr. Hamish Asmath. Uh, the TTSF has been very uh, supportive of the development of the sport of cross-country skiing and winter sport, which is the topic that we are here to speak about today. So thank you, TTSF and Hamish. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the audience for your interest and your passion and your support. The students, uh, first and foremost, for choosing this interesting career. Uh, as you, I hope you will find that uh, there are many diverse ways to follow your passion and to make the world a better place through sport. So good luck to you there. And I'd like to thank, uh, as was referenced earlier, the friends and family that have also uh, come here today. It means a lot to me personally. So thank you very much. So before we get into the content, I thought it would also be good to get to know each other a little bit more. Um, first, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit, but I think uh, Mr. Edwards has covered uh, most of the key points. But from my side, uh, maybe I should, oh, I need to switch over here, excuse me. I didn't realize. Just switching over to the slides so that the online audience. Okay, has it come? Yes. Have all the protective measures. All right. So uh, yes, I'm. I am a, a member of this CIS uh, family, as has been pointed out worked in uh, development, which is the topic of today as a consultant uh, before and after my time at FIFA, then served in FIFA for over 10 years. And now I do consulting in the area of strategy and development, which is what we're talking about, but also more and more in the field of sustainability and impact, which we will touch upon a little bit later today. But uh, interestingly as well, this has been mentioned, I've been uh, doing the opposite of many participants in this program uh, who started as athletes and then pursued a career in management. I pursued a career in management and have suddenly found myself with a, a late athletic career uh, due to various circumstances, but one that I embrace and I'm proud of. Um, I'm representing uh, Trinidad in cross-country skiing, participated in two world championships, hope to get at least one more and, you know, knock on wood, maybe an Olympic Games. Um, but why do I bring that up? Not only because I'm, I'm proud to represent uh, TNT, but it has also given me a very unique perspective on sport development, uh, being on the other side of the table and the other side of many decisions that I was making as a manager and administrator. And um, even after uh, the 10 to 20 years experience in an office, I can definitely say being an athlete has taught me uh, many more things firsthand, which I hope to share with you uh, today. 
So let's look at the agenda for today. Uh, we've got a lot in store, so I will keep moving. Uh, the first part, uh, I would like to start with the development of sport and looking at some historical highlights. Okay, so how did we get to where we are today in this field? Uh, in part two, we will look at what uh, I would consider modern sport development, which I'm sure most of you or all of you are interested in. Uh, we'll look at the theoretical side first. And then in part three, we will look at the practical side with real world examples of programs and projects. In part four, we will touch upon briefly sport for development, which is slightly different to sport development. And then in part five, um, we will talk about program design. So once we've got the history, the theory, and some other practical examples, how can you design your own programs for implementation? And then there will be hopefully some time for questions and answers at the end. And by the way, um, the presentation is designed uh, with some moments for engagement and questions throughout. So uh, please feel free uh, to, to raise your hand uh, during if you have a pressing question. So let's look at part one here, the development of sport. What's important here is uh, the definition here. The development of sport is slightly different, in my opinion, from sport development. And what is the key difference? Development of sport looks retroactively at how the field, how the industry developed over time. We can say somewhat passively or reactively. So how did it grow organically? What were the reasons that it ended up being the phenomenon that it is today? versus sport development, which is our intentional um, programming and activities to proactively nurture and grow sport. Okay, so that's the difference which we will, um, we will touch upon throughout the presentation. And it's, as, is, as it is in many fields, it's important to know our history uh, so that we know how to behave in the present and for the future. So um, there's different ways to start and different moments in time that academics uh, use as a starting point. But one uh, typical one, which we are very familiar with in the, the CIS programs and the FIFA master is in the early 19th century and the codification and standardization of sports and sporting codes in the English public school system. Before this point in time, of course, there was sport, there was active, or there was there were games, let's say, and activities and festivals and celebrations, but there weren't really the standardized disciplines or codes that we today call sport, right? And it, it is in this time that association football was formulated at the football that we know today, soccer, as well as rugby and other uh, disciplines. And here you see an image of the first um, association football rule book that was published by the English Football Association in 1863, okay? So here, the important thing for us is that the concept of sport was established at a moment in history. Before that point in time, it didn't exist or not as we know it today. The second concept to develop is, so now you have a common game that people uh, have a common reference for, of course, they start to play this game with each other or amongst each other and competition emerges. And after you have the codification of sports, you then get the establishment of competition and tournaments as a concept, uh, growing from national, very local and national to the international level. And here you see 
the emergence of the international competitions. And here's an image from the very first World Cup in 1930 in Uruguay. So we have the concept of sport. We have this concept of sport competitions and international competition. What happened next? Obviously humans being humans and being competitive and wanting to be the best. The emergence of professionalization happened. People dedicated their time. Uh, the practitioners wanted to be the best. And then another phenomenon happened. Spectators and fans wanted to see the best. So you had this parallel development of professionalism, which is contrary to amateurism, and the parallel emergence of spectator sport. And one of the first uh, major uh, professional sports um, or athletes to emerge were in baseball. Um, so we've got the sport got the competitions, we've got professionalization, and then what happens next, humans being humans, there emerged the phenomenon of betting and um, the, the notion that the integrity of sport was important because these sport competitions, especially with money at stake, became vulnerable to manipulation. So the concept of sport integrity emerged as a very important issue, which actually still uh, continues to today as an important one. And it highlighted the key role that governing bodies and controlling bodies have uh, to ensure that sport continues to, uh, to enjoy uh, popular recognition and trust with spectators and fans. Emerging from this foundation is uh, the well-known phenomenon of globalization, of course, uh, and sport being uh, just another aspect of human life and, and society and culture. It was also swept up in the tide of globalization. And that brought with it the challenge, as well as the mission to spread sport around the world. Up until this time, a lot of the sport federations were looking uh, to simply, quote, take care of their own or to nurture uh, the sport amongst the existing members as they were. But in this tide of globalization, the outlook definitely shifted to new markets, new territories, new regions. That was fueled in parallel by the emergence of sponsorship and the whole commercial and marketing uh, side of the industry, which was able to finance and fund what emerges now or what we recognize as some of the first sport development programs. Uh, here you see one of the early programs from, I believe it is the 80s, uh, between FIFA and Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola under the uh, um, architecture and leadership of the father of sports marketing, Mr. Patrick Nally, um, and the early FIFA administration devised a development program, a global development program. Uh, and here uh, they supported the under 17 youth boys competition. I believe this one is in Australia and um, a series of development programs. So competitions and development programs funded by a sponsor. This happened in the early days of sponsorship and globalization. Then um, the one of the focal points, let's say, when taking the sport to new territories and uh, new continents even, was twofold, focusing on the basic challenges of awareness and access. So some of these countries that uh, sport federations were trying to develop sport in, they never had a history or a tradition of certain sporting codes or practices. 
um, which meant uh, a need for awareness raising, education, uh, but also basic financing of infrastructure and technical capacity building. So we're talking, focusing on the sport itself. So if you want to have players, you know, do you have coaches? Do you have referees and officials? Um, this was the initial focus, as it should be, right? Here we have some images from one of the early programs as well uh, from FIFA, which was known as the FIFA Goal Program, which was a fi financing and funding program that uh, largely supported uh, projects, especially infrastructure projects. So getting the first um, training academies in many countries, the first stadia and the first headquarters for many of the FIFA member associations and financing some of the first coaching and referee courses as well. Once that phase had subsided, um, there was what I call a next generation of sport development programs. And uh, interestingly enough, this is when I began to personally join the story when I finished the FIFA Master in 2003, uh, 2004. At that time, FIFA had already implemented, uh, let's call it this first generation of largely infrastructure oriented development programs and was asking the question, well, what next? What's the next frontier? And uh, after a lot of con consultation and research uh, that I was very proud to participate in, um, it was determined that uh, there's a lot that can be done off the pitch. Oops, sorry, I see I've missed a, a slide here. Um, just back on technical matters, one, um, one thing to, to stress uh, is that um, after this first round of, like I said, infrastructure and core facilities was constructed in the second generation then, um, it was about expanding the, the reach of programs to demographics and target groups that were not uh, captured by the first wave. So a lot of initial programs, as you can imagine, were focused on men's um, sport and the men's national team or the elite uh, teams of many countries to allow them to participate in the World Cup or in Olympic Games. Um, and this second generation of development programs uh, tried to replicate a lot of the similar successes, but for other groups like women, like youth, boys and girls. Okay. Sometimes it was also a question of regions. In many countries, uh, the capital cities or the urban centers were very well developed and supported, but the outer regions and municipalities were not. So that became the new frontier. Okay. And now it comes to the point I was making about um, off the pitch uh, development that uh, this is, and this is where I joined in, where we realized that this is the next frontier of developing the management uh, capabilities, the administrative capabilities of sport organizations. And in, in, um, in no, uh, um, in, in, every, in every way, programs like this program here at UE and the CIES um, University Network and the FIFA Master are also part of this next generation of sport development, training uh, managers and administrators to, to develop the sports further. Okay, and here you can see a um, very lively photo from one of the editions of the FIFA Master. And uh, I picked one with a, a Trini flag and a very handsome young man in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, you might recognize him. He's, he's sitting right there. And we're, you're going to move so I can open the door? I'm trying to open the door. Sorry? Is that a question or just ignore it? Okay. 
All right, so um, that was a very, very fast recap <laughs> of the history of, uh, of, some, of some historical highlights of sport development. Uh, uh, I don't know, Roland, I think we covered the, the Leicester module in, uh, in uh, 30 minutes there. So <laughs> a lot of value for, for money here in, uh, in UWE. Now part two, uh, I'd like to look at um, modern sport development theory, okay? Uh, so we started with the, the concept of sport being established, competition, professionalization, uh, integrity, then we saw sponsorship, we saw the infrastructure focus, the technical focus, then the non-technical focus off the pitch. Where are we now? Okay. Well, we are at a stage where we can define sport development. And what would I like to suggest that definition be? It's the following. It is the intentional conducting of activities or initiatives to achieve specific developmental aims or objectives concerning sport or sports. And I've highlighted in yellow or orange the, the key words there. Intentional. Why? Why is this important for your sport programs? Because a lot of activity is happening. There's a lot of uh, leagues, there's a lot of camps, there's a lot of games and tournaments. And some may argue that there are developmental benefits, and I would agree, of course. The, the more you have people playing, um, the more the sport uh, develops. It's, it's quite logical. But is it a development program? That's the question. And what is it trying to achieve? And that's what makes the difference. If it is intentionally trying to have a specific outcome, are you trying to improve the performance of a certain group of athletes? Or is it not about performance? Is it about participation? Is it about access? Is it about providing young girls an opportunity that they never had before? So what is the objective? of a program, right? So these are the key uh, components that it must be intentional. There must be activities, of course, and initiatives, and they must have a specific developmental aim or objective. Because without that, it's just playing around, which, which is nice, but at least we call it what it is. So, what are the typical key objectives then for sport development programs? First of all, the big one is access. There are many sports for which uh, aspiring athletes or participants simply do not have access. It's the simplest hurdle, or maybe not the simplest, but it's the first hurdle to address. Um, this is one that uh, we are tackling with the Ski Federation. You know, how do Trinabagonians pursue an interest or a passion to ski? Can they do it here in Trinidad and Tobago? Not on snow. So what is the answer? Well, that'll be the topic of another presentation, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it could also be a question of geography, right? So the sport might be accessible in some parts of the country, but not in others. And we will unpack this a little bit in a, in a moment. The next objective, main objective, tends to be participation, which is not the same as access. So access means can a participant, a participant that wants to participate, can they? It's a yes or no question. The second objective participation is, okay, people, people have access, but are they accessing, right? So that's, that's another question. So maybe you've done the work, 
you have uh, beautiful facilities, you made a competition or, or, or a, a training camp available, but are people showing up? Or you have a game and you're selling tickets, right? Like, are they coming is the question. Are they practicing? The next big objective is performance. Um, obviously, this is important for many federations and governing bodies. So you've provided access. You have some athletes or participants practicing or playing. Are they performing? This is the third objective for many sports organizations. Fourthly is what I call quality. So there's a lot of organizations and athletes that perform, but through adverse circumstances. And this is something that I've heard many times um, uh, in conversation with Trinidad and Tobago athletes. And it's actually something that we are both proud of, but also something that leaves a lot of room for improvement that as a small island nation, we punch above our weight on the international stage. Uh, you know, not having the same access to facilities or funding that maybe some other big nations have, but still delivering medals and performances. What point four highlights is the quality of experience that the athletes and the participants have. Um, does it always have to be so hard and against the current, right? Uh, can we provide uh, uh, top line, top level, dare we say, pleasurable <laughs> experiences for our athletes and participants? And um, here we can look at quality from two perspectives, quality in terms of provision of services and um, the sport. So as sports managers and administrators, the sport that we are offering our participants and fans and spectators, is it of a quality level? And we can also look at it on the flip side which is as an athlete or as a participant, are we experiencing a quality experience that is delivered to us, right? And finally, um, the fifth key objective that I would like to highlight is sustainability. So let's say you have a situation where you have access, you have participation, have a degree of performance you're happy with, things are at an acceptable quality level. The fifth and final question is how long can that last? How long can you keep it up, right? Maybe you're doing it now, but can you continue to do it next year and the year after that, five years from now, 10 years from now, right? This is the long-term and sustainability thinking that uh, rounds off this evolutionary, let's say, uh, analysis of sport development. And these represent what I've noticed as the typical key objectives for sport development programs. There's another framework uh, that um, might be useful for some of you in terms of remembering what these five are. Uh, I call them the five Ps. So uh, instead of access, we can consider possibility. Is it possible for athletes and participants to practice a sport? Participation, number two, is it, are, are we uh, trying to increase participation? Number three, performance as well, the same. Number four, we can look at it as professionalization of the delivery or even the pleasure of participation, okay? And then finally, permanence. How permanent are these activities that we are developing? So, just a quick note here on technical matters because uh, there are a lot of 
technicians perhaps here, but certainly in the industry that um, advocate very strongly for the technical matters being at the center of sport development. And of course, I will be the first to second that, that without the sport itself, there is no sport to develop. So what does that mean? That means coaches, it means officials, it means um, the players and athletes themselves. So technical matters and technical development are important aspects. We can even consider them the core or the foundation of sport uh, development. But what I want to stress with you today, and I would like you to take away from this presentation and lecture, is that they are not the only uh, aspects of sport development. That there is a wide world off the pitch, so to speak, of sport development. And I would like to suggest that sport development can involve literally anything that can make an impact on the desired developmental objectives, those five areas we saw earlier, the five Ps. And I would like to go a little bit into detail through those five, just to, to give them a little more uh, meat on the bone, okay? So let's talk access. What, what are some forms of access? that you can think about. And I'll start by sharing a few examples from my, my work and experience. When I was doing some work in Asia with the Asian Football Confederation, after a consultative process engaging the different member associations, one of the top recommendations for football development in the continent and the region was the construction of an additional set of changing rooms and facilities at all sports infrastructure. Now, does anyone have an idea why that was highlighted as one of the top infrastructure development needs? Exactly, I heard access for women, because a lot of sports infrastructure was built just with men in mind, and also in countries where um, separate facilities for women was a, it's a very important cultural and religious topic. And without those female changing rooms and restrooms, that was a huge obstacle for enabling the participation and access first to the sport for women and girls. So even something as simple as bathrooms and changing rooms can be an important developmental topic for access. Another example um, is uh, equipment. So there are many sports that uh, you know, not like athletics, which you simply can just start running, or maybe you need some shoes to run. No problem. But, um, you know, think of ice hockey, for example, um, or potentially cricket, maybe to a degree, I don't know. But golf is another good example. There's a lot of sports that have um, pretty high thresholds uh, of equipment um, required to get started, even at youth level. And I've seen interesting examples of uh, equipment sharing uh, programs where uh, communities pitch in together to have shared equipment uh, so that um, you know, many families and kids uh, can participate. And that opens up access to certain sports uh, much more than before. But I'd like to solicit uh, maybe one or two examples from the room. What are some other interesting examples of access that you all have observed or maybe you think need to be addressed either here or internationally? Any, any ideas or thoughts? 
I'm putting you on the spot. Let's see how, how sharp this new cohort is. But it doesn't have to only be the students. Anyone? Yes? Oops, do we have the microphone? Hi. Is it on? Is the microphone on? Check, check. Check. Just a second. Okay. Yeah. Yes, so um, I'm involved in the sport of table tennis. And two areas that we currently are facing in terms of access would be venue availability, mm -hmm. right? Because of course, table tennis, you need an indoor facility where you can put the tables down and so forth. So access to a uh, venue, both at the club level and at the national level, and then of course, access to funding. So yeah. for us to get anything done, basically, uh, yeah. funding is a, a critical issue. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll take that. Okay. So we've talked about access. What is the next uh, objective? Participation. So I've seen um, some interesting examples uh, to enhance participation here. Um, simple low-hanging fruit like scheduling, dates and times. Sometimes just simply the date or the day of the week that activities are organized can have a tremendous impact on uh, driving the participation, especially when youth and kids are involved because they are often dependent on uh, their parents or caregivers or family to take them <laughs> somewhere or to pick them up or in relation to their school program, right? So I've seen it many times that sports administrators with the best of intentions, they put a lot of heart and soul into a, a program, but it's just scheduled at the wrong time <laughs> or on the wrong day. And if they would only have known or consulted uh, the key groups and put the events on a better day of the week, then the participation would have been much higher. So it could be something as simple as that. Another thing that I've seen in uh, around the world is uh, scheduling things based on time or the, the weather. Uh, there are many countries, uh, for example, in the Middle East um, or in Africa where it's just really hot during the day. So a lot of, of um, sporting activity either happens very early in the morning or in the evening before the sun comes up or when the sun comes down. I was just in Azerbaijan uh, recently and joined a, a running club. Uh, that trains at uh, 5 and 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I was surprised to see how many people uh, do that. But uh, shout out to the ultra and trail runners in Azerbaijan. Um, related to timing, um, infrastructure can also help enable timing. So floodlights and indoor facilities. Can you guys think how those can be tremendous drivers for participation? Anyone? Yeah? I see some heads nodding. When uh, you are in one of these uh, environments where uh, practicing during the night is much, it's just much more feasible than during the day, then often it does require lighting. So, that is another key uh, request I've seen in a lot of uh, the projects that I've been involved in, 
that uh, floodlights um, for any outdoor sport really um, have been a key um, aspect of sport participation development because it enables um, uh, citizens and participants to, to practice uh, throughout the evening and it provides you know 10 to 12 more hours of participation that uh, you wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, indoor facilities as well can be crucial for uh, driving participation or enabling participation and access. I was on a mission in Mongolia uh, in Asia once and um, this was their number one infrastructure request. Why? Because I learned that Mongolia has some of the coldest temperatures on planet Earth. <laughs> and uh, when I was there, I think it was minus 35 centigrade. And um, it's simply impossible to practice any outdoor sports um, in those conditions. And so having indoor facilities is crucial to allow um, the, continued, the continued practice of sport for uh, sometimes half or even more than half of the year when it's the cold season. So can you imagine that without an indoor facility, you would have half the year or a third of the year um, not an option for certain sport practice, okay? Next, excuse, before you go, I'm just going to say a comment from Steve Passat based on your question. Yes. Where the events are being held, sometimes travel is difficult to get to the events. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, during my, I can give you one good example of that. Uh, during my time at FIFA, um, there was, uh, uh, of course, with a lot of the increased demands for um, uh, compliance, and auditing and uh, reviewing requests, there, there was a request for seaplane transfers. I think that's, if that's the right um, term, these airplanes that uh, can land on the water and, and fly from island to island. So uh, some member associations had, uh, had uh, uh, invoices or, or receipts for seaplane expenses, and they said that was crucial for the participation in uh, competitions. And after an intern, uh, a review of the situation, it was deemed uh, appropriate that that was the best and most cost-effective way, perhaps even the only way in some situations for certain teams and athletes uh, to participate in some competitions here in the islands. So, uh, yes, to answer, to reply to the question, access is very important. And uh, the solution to that access uh, can, can be very interesting and different uh, depending on the environment. Um, in terms of performance, um, there's obviously many, many ways uh, that this uh, can be influenced. I mean, we know all the traditional ways, hard work, training, uh, dedication, there's no skipping that. But uh, I've also seen from the administrative and management point of view, some interesting uh, approaches. One is simply uh, translation services, making technical material available in the language of your people. So maybe that's not so much an issue here in Trinidad and Tobago be, being an English speaking nation and there's a lot of content for most topics uh, in English. But if you can imagine for other countries where uh, English is not the national language or even any other uh, global language, translation of technical texts and materials or videos uh, into a language of young boys and girls and of participants. It's not a sexy topic. It's not a sophisticated topic, but it's a fundamental one uh, that really uh, uh, provides access of those people to 
fundamental training and technical material. Um, and this is why as well, uh, FIFA, uh, I think it was not too long ago, I think one or two years ago, um, recognized a few more languages as official languages of FIFA, uh, such as Arabic, Chinese, Russian, etc., to open uh, access to materials to languages that literally impact millions of people around the world. Actually, billions, if you think about it. Uh, internet access is another one. Um, that was also a very popular demand from sports development programs that uh, the internet is such a fundamental tool to access information and content. Uh, so technical content is not immune to that. And so to enable people in certain countries or in certain regions of certain countries to access technical content, um, having access to the internet is, is important. Um, just quick around the room here, any interesting examples anyone would like to share in terms of performance uh, programs that they would like to share with the group or interesting solutions you've seen for performance? Yep. I mean, I want to speak about it, but their program, the long-term athletic development, also known as LTAD, that they're doing with a, a, a cohort of young persons um, is phenomenal um, to note that they are taking young athletes and holistically developing them to be able to ensure that there's sustained development um, of their athletes. And if anybody understands what LTA does is traditional development of athletes is seen as a pyramid. So as you get higher up in terms of specialization, there is more fallout in the sport. But in terms of long-term athletic development, it's more of a square whereby as you go up, you have less attrition and more retention in terms of athletes. So shout out to the Table Tennis Federation for, you know, their work in the long-term athletic development programs. Great, thank you. When I, when I think about performance, I'm thinking results. Must have some form of results in order to measure and to continue to get in support. So is there, is there anything specific when you're looking at results as part of performance? What would you say? Thank you. It's a very good question. There's a lot of national programs, um, whether they are on the governmental side or on the sports side, maybe from the Olympic Committee or a, a national federation that looks a lot at performance. And often that is considered as medals um, or podiums. So top three, maybe top 10 finishes. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and those should be tracked and measured. But what I would like to encourage managers and administrators and sports organizations to also track and follow is the developmental pathway to get to that result. So more often than not, you're not going to go from no medals one day to a gold medal the next day. There's a journey. What is that journey? That journey, and this is something we are looking at at the Ski Federation as an example, Right now, we do not have an athlete in the top, you know, so many hundred top athletes in the world. Maybe that can be a target, right, um, to, to break certain thresholds of rankings. It can also be a target to qualify for certain competitions or events. Um, some of my colleagues in the developing ski world, uh, they say the audio where you can't see the picture. many nations... Uh, compete 
for metals. Sure, I didn't get the audio too. Whereas the they get the new old thing, but I, I didn't know what happened. Just to make part. So, Did you get to summarize, I don't know how to review photos. I would encourage uh, a thoughtful um, documentation of different performance milestones that considers qualification even to certain events as well as um, rankings and performance in those events to, to, to instead of just looking at it as no medals to medals, looking at it in terms of intermediate steps. So yeah, maybe meddling at the world championship is the goal one day, but before that, is there, you know, are there regional games, maybe Pan American or Commonwealth, uh, and then the national championships, or, uh, you know, all the way down, right? And um, it's hard work, and every sport is different because the context is different. But thank you for the question. Hope I answered. Nick? Yes? Another comment from Steve Passard. Setting metrics and milestones where he lives in the US, the concept of an athletic director and a coach, the coach is accountable to and for the development of the program. His first year as a head coach, he had to present a three-year plan on building the program as well as improving results. Okay. Uh, it's a comment, comment from, okay. yeah. Great, thank you. So quickly ahead here, um, we talked about uh, professionalization and uh, this quality objective, number four. Um, yes, there's, there's a lot of examples of this, but I will intentionally provide some different ones just to provide you with a different perspective on simple things that can make a big difference. Um, I've seen the emergence of uh, apps and chat groups, uh, for example, WhatsApp. It's, a, it's an app that you know, many people have, um, and many sports clubs and uh, training groups creating these chats to set times to, uh, to uh, inform their members when training is happening or if there's a change. Um, it doesn't sound like a rocket science, but I tell you, these things work. Um, I'm part of a running club. Uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, the On Running Club, and one of their keys to success is um, is committing to one time in a week and ensuring that there will be one at least one person uh, there to guide the the group. Wednesdays, six thirty p.m. You know, rain or shine, there will be somebody there, and there will be. Uh, a, a training session. And so instead of, you know, trying to find a way to get the group to, to confirm to the training session, you just need to confirm one person. And as long as the group knows that one person is going to be there, then they're confident that they can show up and they won't be alone. And it works beautifully. Um, some other examples. Uh, simple paved roads or sidewalks. I know cycling is a very big sport here, uh, at least in terms of results. Uh, the, the Team TTO does well in, in terms of cycling. But the question is, are there a lot of good cycling paths and roads uh, in the country? And this is something that many nations and cities struggle with sometimes, right? And as a ski practitioner, I can also tell you that simple paved either roads or sidewalks or cycleways are a, uh, a quality enhancer uh, that uh, boosts participation, I would say performance as well, because then it allows um, people to train with better conditions. And it's not a sophisticated thing. It's simply a flat <laughs> paved road. Um, another example that is um, a common request uh, 
an area of interest with many national federations is uh, nutrition support in a cafeteria at their national training centers or, or having the budget to provide food and nutrition because that's often one of the things uh, inhibiting elite performance. It's simply that a lot of athletes aren't <laughs> eating either enough or well enough. And, um, you know, sport uh, is demanding, especially at a high performance level. And uh, it's simply, um, and we are biological entities. So even something as simple as the provision of food and nutrition uh, can be tremendous boosters for the quality of sport development programs. Then finally, in terms of sustainability, uh, kind of echoing a bit uh, the comment made um, from Mr. Persad, the having a multi-year outlook is another key basic step that I would like to encourage all administrators do from this point forward if they're not doing it already. We have the tendency in sport to just deal, to, to live in the present, to live one year at a time, often because funding is only one year at a time. If even that, uh, I know there are situations where funding is even, maybe even for just an event or, or several months, uh, which I understand is very challenging, but the only way to break that cycle is to really impose upon yourself and the community this multi-year outlook. How are we going to break this cycle? How are we going to be comfortable for two years, for three years, maybe five years, and eventually, hopefully more, okay? So thinking multi-year, especially financially, uh, but not only that, as well as human resources, um, thinking of your next generation of leaders and, um, and uh, drivers of the sport uh, is crucial. I became aware of a very nice program at the Youth Olympic Games in Lillehammer, Youth Winter Olympic uh, Games in Norway, Lillehammer, Norway, um, where all the functional areas, they made it a point to designate and appoint a youth leader to be the, the responsible for that. So whether it was transportation or accommodation or competition management, uh, there was a young person who was front and center in the lead. Now, they had a senior, more experienced person and a team behind them to guide them and to support them, but it was their show. And the, the point of that Youth Olympic Games was to empower those young people with the experience, but also to deliver the message that you guys are the next generation, right? So I thought that was a very nice program. And there are uh, many of those young members who are, in fact, the current <laughs> leaders in their sports uh, in those areas. So the program worked. <laughs> OK. Um, now, sport, modern sport development in practice. Why have we taken this journey the way we have and, and, and how do we approach this next section? The way I like to think of it is we, we've just, um, in the same way that a, a wine connoisseur has developed that refined taste for fine wine, you know, those unique taste profiles. Actually, we have a, a French Frenchman here, so he can uh, relate and explain to us the nuances of sophisticated wine appreciation or whiskey or fine art. You know, it takes that experience to appreciate um, the nuances of something complex. Now that we look at some programs conducted by some 
leading sports institutions. And with that theoretical and historical background that we've just been through together, you should now have that refined palette to analyze and assess the programs that I'm about to show you and to see, ah, I see what they did there, or I, I see the objective they're trying to achieve, okay? Hopefully uh, more than you did at the beginning of the presentation. And before we, we dive into those specific examples, um, this can be a really big uh, um, dive down the rabbit hole of a lot of these current topics, but I wanted to share at least a sampling of some of the hot topics today. So we have, an, in no particular order, you know, digitalization, we're, we're living in an increasingly digital world. So the ability to operate in a digital environment is crucial for many sports. Uh, data and analytics is uh, also very important, especially as it helps uh, drive decisions, right? Social media is a phenomenon for better or for worse. And there certainly are negatives, but there are some advantages as well. In the middle column, we see a lot of sustainability topics like inclusivity, mental health, and advocacy. So a lot of development work of sport organizations and governing bodies is actually not so much implementation anymore because that might be with their members or affiliates, but their role is more as an advocate to be a, a leader in terms of thought and principles that others then implement, okay? And then on that far right, column, governance, compliance, sport integrity, and the topics of redistribution, equity, and competitive balance. We've heard of things like financial fair play uh, in football, but it's not only in football. Um, you know, ethics and compliance. These are all important topics for sport development that are not under the, quote, technical domain only. So for today, I've chosen three international uh, federations that I thought might be relevant for Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. So we have FIFA, the governing body of football, as you know, World Athletics, and the ICC, the International Cricket Council. FIFA's flagship development program is called FIFA Forward. And right now, FIFA is in the third iteration of this. So it's called Forward 3.0. If you look it up online, it's largely a financial support program, uh, but there are some non-financial components and uh, the current, and it's on a cyclical basis. So we're in the middle of the 2023-2026 cycle. The, um, just some numbers, so you get a feeling for the magnitude. Uh, it's 5 million US, do uh, US dollars per member association over four years for operational costs. So it's a, a million and a quarter per year for operations, 3 million per MA over that time period as well for projects, and we'll look at those in a moment. And for uh, certain MAs that have a need, uh, 1.2 million uh, for national team travel and accommodation to participate in competitions, and as well as for equipment like footballs and bibs and cones. The, um, in addition to that, there's also financial support to confederations, which are these continental governing bodies. So for Trinidad and Tobago, it's CONCACAF and zonal and regional associations. And so for Trinidad, it's the CFU, the Caribbean Football Union, of which we had, I think somebody at the graduation ceremony 
uh, last night. Um, FIFA also provides some digital tools. So these are some of the non-financial uh, components. So there is FIFA Connect, which is a digital player and athlete registration, registration platform. Uh, DTMS, which is a domestic transfer and matching system, which connects to an international transfer matching system for player transfers domestically and internationally. And this Connect ID, which is the, it's their form of a player passport. It's a digital identity of a player that is used in FIFA Connect. And there's still the same capacity building and coaching and training initiatives, as well as specific targets like setting the target for 60 million female players participating in global football by the end of the cycle. Um, I know it might be too small to read, so I will, uh, I will just mention these categories that the operational costs are supposed to cover. So when you think of development programs, right, that you might be financing or funding or requesting funding for, what are considered operations? It could be men's competitions, women's competitions, the men's national team, the women's national team, boys and girls competitions, the boys and girls national teams, um, the IT systems, the registration, or a competition system, a program for referees and officials. And those are the, the blue boxes there. And then recently for FIFA 3.0, they added these 10 new um, categories of which the members are asked to perform five. And those are uh, safeguarding initiatives. So initiatives to protect the you know, children um, and their welfare, anti-discrimination, compliance, uh, combating manipulation, combating doping, reducing adverse environmental impact, uh, facilitating dispute resolution. So often, especially in a very professionalized sport like football, there's a lot of um, disputes that arise, contract issues. Uh, so uh, having proper systems and processes to deal with that is important. Um, match and event security and anything that supports uh, good governance. Okay? These are things that FIFA recognizes as legitimate operational costs of a federation. And... Um, to kind of illustrate it in terms of real projects in real countries, we have a video I would like to switch uh, to show. Thank you. Just switching back. Actually, we uh, you can stay. Yeah. Um, did you notice anything? Did you see some of those objectives? Oops. Um, raise your hand if you saw access being addressed. Yes. Did they yep, find some, a way? Some facilities were being constructed that didn't exist before. What about participation? Did you see that addressed? Yes. What about performance? Yes, I see heads nodding. Uh, I, I particularly liked the comment from, I think, two, of, uh, two, two boys. They said, our passing has improved now that we have a, with this new pitch, right? Because <laughs> you can imagine a bumpy pitch, uh, it's hard to, to make a good pass. Um, quality, yes, and sustainability. Right. So, um, unless there's any questions or comments anybody wants to make here on the FIFA case, we'll move quickly on in the interest of time. Okay. So the next one, 
is uh, also a video. It's from World Athletics, okay? They've launched a new um, global uh, world plan. And uh, this was launched at their Congress in 2021. Here's their president, Sebastian Coe, explaining that a little bit. a deep dive into the world plan. Uh, the Congress was important because uh, for the sport, it was about the adoption and adoption of a series of important initiatives that really are designed to accelerate the growth of our sport over the next decade. Today, uh, the Congress approved the world plan 2022 to 2030, which sets clear objectives against world athletics vision for the sport. It builds on the four year strategic plan and the four pillars of more participation, more fans, uh, more people, and more partners. Crucially, uh, the world plan includes a renewed kids' athletics development program, which will be rolled out around the world over uh, the coming months. Uh, created by coaches, teachers, and young people around the globe, kids' athletics is one of the biggest grassroots development programs in the world of sport. It was created in 2002, and since then has been comprehensively reviewed, updated in 2021 and made available digitally to be even more inclusive, flexible, adaptable and for fun for young people and the practitioners. Uh, developing athletes and creating pathways for them to move easily from playground to podium lies at the heart of what all our member federations do. Not every federation will have an elite athlete winning medals on a global stage and this we also discussed at the Congress. but. Every federation has athletes that are national champions. We know that every successful journey needs to be mapped out so we can see the different paths we can take from elite to recreational athlete and all those in between, including the critical supporting roles of coach, official administrators, parents and volunteers. We need everyone wherever they are and whatever their ability or ambition to know that when they step off the path for whatever reason, they know there is a way back to be involved and participate in athletics if they choose to take it. For me, this is what the World Plan for Athletics helps us establish. It sets out 19 objectives and 67 actions, which is common in all these objectives, uh, and that they really do come from deep and wide-ranging insights from organizations and individuals who are passionate about our sport and its future development. These insights call for us to embrace a shift in mindset about many aspects of athletics. It requires us to be brave, to challenge the status quo, to try new things and think differently. Not everything we try will be universally popular. Some may not work, but we all agree we must be ambitious and brave in setting our roadmap for growth. The Congress also received the first report of the Human right, Rights Working we can Group, pause. which includes six recommendations for World Athletics to follow overseas. Okay. It's my screen. Yep. Great. So that was the president, Sebastian Coe, explaining the world plan in 2021. What are some of the highlights from that that I would like to point out? Um, yeah, this might be small to read, so I'll... I'll, I'll read from my side. The first thing I thought World Athletics did well here is they, they had a plan. To have a world plan that all its members signed up to, I think this is a very progressive uh, step for an international federation. So it's one thing, for example, for an organization like FIFA to have a program available for its members, which is great. But what I think is really good here with World Athletics is there is a, a plan um, with goals, objectives, and actions. And you see the second box here. Yep. 
Uh, President Co highlighted 19 objectives and 67 actions to galvanize uh, the movement and the community. Okay, so that's the second thing I wanted to highlight, as well as these four pillars uh, to also concentrate activity and initiatives. So starting at the top right, there's uh, more participation. So that's obviously participation, whoops. Then more people involved. So the human resource, the human side of things, more fans and more partnerships. This is what World Athletics has identified as their strategic pillars. Another interesting approach, which has been their uh, path, but maybe it's not the path for everyone else, but something for you to consider is they have taken a decentralized development approach. So what does that mean? Instead of centralizing and driving things from themselves in, in a way that FIFA does, for example, they have decentralized the approach. So they have the world plan, they align on targets and pillars, but the responsibility for driving that is with other actors, mainly the regional entities. Um, and they encourage those entities and the members, the national federations to pursue funding from other stakeholders. And maybe that's the difference. Maybe that's why they have this decentralized approach FIFA, with its centralized funding, is able to conduct a centralized approach, whereas maybe in the case of athletics, they've taken this decentralized approach to support its members in finding funding from other stakeholders, such as the IOC through Olympic Solidarity Initiatives, World Athletics itself, uh, which offers grants for um, administration and competition and projects, but definitely not to the same magnitude that FIFA does, as well as supporting the members to approach other development and funding bodies like development banks and the government. Oops. Okay, um, any questions or comments here on World Athletics before we tackle our final um, practical case? Okay, and that is the ICC. So the ICC also has what they called uh, a global growth framework or global growth plan. Uh, which helps to align on purpose and vision. It has three main pillars. So somewhat similar, but a little bit different from what World Athletics has. They focus on strengthening uh, the sport. Okay, so um, the, the community and the system, growing it and protecting it. Those are their three focal areas. <laughs> In order to do that, they've identified six strategic priority projects. So what is that? Digital, so digital platforms, uh, the Olympics, okay? So for cricket, trying to break into the Olympics is a, is a strategic priority for them. Um, supporting and nurturing and growing the ICC events developing women's cricket, number four, developing USA as a market strategically, and boosting participation. And what I like about this, um, this presentation and the identification of these goals is that they're not the typical cookie cutter goals that you might see in a generic uh, strategic plan you can clearly see that the, the cricket community has thought about what does it need to do uniquely to develop its sport, right? So for example, um, 
women's cricket, so developing women's sport is something that is somewhat universal. So maybe that's not so special, but targeting the USA as a market, that is, that is unique. Or targeting the Olympics, that's not something that all sports have because um, some are already in the Olympics. Um, I can attest that uh, uh, I, I grew up in the States and in my hometown there in, in Dallas, uh, there was a lot of buzz recently about the new cricket team that uh, has started there. And I can also attest that since I've landed on the island now, what's it, two or three days, all the rage has been the, the CPL and the, and the cricket here. So clearly, uh, some things are, are working uh, for this strategy. Another uh, thing I would like to highlight that I think the ICC does well that you should uh, take on board is understanding the important role of language for the growth and development of their sport. If you go to the website, and if you look at their technical development materials and educational materials, they have produced excellent videos um, about cricket in nine interesting strategic languages. So you have English, um, but also Arabic, French, Mandarin Chinese, German, Indonesian, Japanese, Spanish, and Portuguese. And I can tell you, these are not by coincidence, okay? They've thought about which languages are essential to, to support the growth of cricket around the world um, and help educate not only players and officials, but fans and spectators uh, in new markets. And I would like to share briefly one of those examples. Now, for many of you here, uh, the content of the video may not be new to you. Maybe you, you already know cricket, but what I would like to stress is the quality of the video, the production quality, the way they make it interesting and exciting for somebody who may not have any idea what cricket is. So if we can switch back to the videos and uh, have a look. So this video is called, what, what is cricket? Cricket is a sport that is played by millions and loved by billions of people from all corners of the globe. Cricket has been played for centuries, with the first international match occurring way back in 1844. From that time, it has continued to develop into the vibrant and exciting modern game that is played today. Cricket is a bat and ball sport that involves two teams with 11 players on each side. The aim of the game is to score more runs than the opposition. One player, the bowler, bowls a hard leather ball at speeds of up to 150 km per hour at a player from the opposing team who then attempts to hit it with a bat in order to score runs. Cricket is played on an oval-shaped field, and in the middle of that field is the pitch, which is where most of the action takes place. At either end of the pitch, you'll find these things. They're called wickets and they're made up of three wooden stumps that support two bales. They're important, but we'll come back to them shortly. The batting team has two batters at a time in play, whilst the fielding side has all 11 players on the field. A batter scores runs in two ways. One, they hit the ball far enough that it crosses the outer boundary of the field. If the ball has bounced, it's worth four runs.
If it clears the boundary on the full, it's worth six, the maximum number of runs that can be scored from one hit. Two, through the two batters running the length of the pitch in opposite directions whilst the fielders are retrieving the ball. One length of the pitch completed equals one run. The aim for the fielding side is to restrict the number of runs scored by the batting side whilst trying to get the batter out. There are 11 different ways a batter can be out, with the most common being bold. The bowler bowls the ball, the batter misses it or deflects it by accident, it hits the stumps and the bails come off. Caught, the batter hits the ball and one of the fielders catches it before it hits the ground. Leg before wicket, LBW, exactly what the name suggests. The bowler bowls the ball, the batter misses it, and the ball hits them on the leg in line with the stumps. Run out, the batter hits the ball and runs, but the fielding team retrieve the ball and throw it to the stumps before either batter has reached the other end. When a batter's out, they leave the field of play and another teammate replaces them. Once all the batters on a team are out, the sides swap, and the fielding team then have their turn to bat and attempt to beat the overall score set by the first batting team. Put simply, the winner is the team with the most runs after both sides have batted. much. And we can switch back. Oops. So, um, did you enjoy the scenes of West Indies cricket? <laughs> Thought you would. So coming back to the presentation. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I encourage you, especially if you're a cricket fan, to check out the ICC's website and their video library. They have uh, many different topics that they cover. This was the overview, but then they go into detail on various subjects. And uh, if education is something important to your sport, maybe it's a niche sport, maybe it's a sport that not many people know about. I think, uh, Hamish, I think for skiing, <laughs> we do have to do a lot of education. Um, there is, uh, this might be a relevant topic for you. Okay. Um, we won't do it now, but uh, I would also like to highlight another initiative of the ICC which is they have a great um, initiative of recognizing development programs. So they have an award for best development uh, initiatives of the year. And so if you're in a position in your organization, if you are supporting multiple development programs or initiatives that uh, recognizing those, uh, the ones that are, are doing well um, or the best ones, that can also be a great morale boosting uh, and performance boosting at the end of the day uh, initiative. Oops. Any comments, questions here on what the ICC is doing in cricket before we move on? Okay, all good. Nothing online, great. So, um, Coming to part four, sport for development. Now, this is a topic um, you know, very close to my heart and I think close to um, many of yours as well. At least that's what I gathered from the graduation ceremony last night that uh, many people, if not all of us, really believe in the, the power of sport uh, as a tool for positive social uh, change and development. Um, so that is not in question. But 
it is a specific and emerging field of its own. And uh, it's definitely related to sport development, but it is uh, a little bit different. So what is sport for development? The definition we would like to suggest is that it is the field or practice of achieving positive social or environmental impact both with and through sport. So let's unpack that. Positive social or environmental impact. So a lot is said about the good that sport can do or can achieve, but what is that good? You know, often we hear it's it's uh, facilitates health, health obviously, um, education. Uh, there's a lot of synergies, but is that it? Well, obviously not. It's it's a, it can be much more than that. Uh, in fact, in the next slide, we'll go into to greater detail there. And in terms of with and through sport, why have we chosen that distinction? What's the difference between with sport and through sport? The difference is, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a matter of perspective, okay? So if you are a sporting organization and if you are delivering or implementing sport and you're trying to achieve positive social outcomes through your activities, that is through sport, okay? Now, if you are a sponsor, let's say, if you're a Digicel, or if you're Carib Beer, and uh, you want to partner with a sport organization or an event, and to achieve a positive social outcome with that partner, that is achieving a social outcome with sport, okay? So we talked about the uh, positive social environmental impact. For many years, this was a very broad and ambiguous phrase. But thankfully, um, in the last years, uh, since the, um, I think the 2000s, uh, the United Nations has established the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which um, clarifies 17 international goals that represent what development means. Now, of course, this sparks a lot of debate and philosophical discussions and interpretations. Maybe people uh, have different views on if there should, should be 17 or if it should be 16 or maybe it should be 20. But for the moment, this is the international reference. And when designing sport for development programs, it would be, I recommend you to use this framework to, to, um, to describe the impact that you want to achieve. And so what, what are some of those impacts? And does this work? Yes. So I'll just come here. So, you know, that's not easy to read. Um, obviously, addressing poverty, uh, uh, hunger, health, education, equality, clean water and sanitation, right? Sustainable energy, uh, clean energy, economic growth, infrastructure and industry, inequality sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnerships for the goals. Why have we taken a few minutes to reference these? If you haven't embraced this already, I strongly encourage you all to understand that sport can impact all of those areas. As I've been investigating this for the better part of now 20 years uh, in parallel to my other professional work, I've seen enough examples in all of these areas to uh, attest and affirm 
that sport can play a role in even some of the most obscure examples. So if you look at life below water, I don't know if you consider that an obscure one. I've seen examples from, from sailing and surfing where water uh, projects are essential uh, for them. If you look at equity or industry in cities, they're very interesting and creative sport programs. So it is possible. Okay, the sky is, is definitely the, the limit here. And what's the, the message in this presentation on sport development? The, the key message is that these two spheres are not mutually exclusive and they can be synergistic. I would like to venture and suggest that over time, what are considered two separate fields now will become closer and maybe even merge in the future in that sport development essentially will be sport for development, that the positive impact that sport can provide to society will be an integral part of the programs that you, future sport administrators and managers, will have as your development programs. So when you are making pitches and presentations about your the next greatest development program, it will have as a component the positive social and community outcomes. Um, it, it'll be maybe even second nature. Okay, Right now it's an extra effort, but hopefully in the future it will just be business as usual. Okay, And in doing so, as the second and third uh, bullets point out, this um, allows for um, greater stakeholder engagement, um, the opportunity to create more buzz and enthusiasm and support, um, not just moral support, perhaps uh, uh, material support, but also financially. There are sponsors that are keen on this, um, uh, increasingly so, and many government and development agencies also have it as, as a directive or a mandate to support development programs. And if you can package your sport development program also as a sport for development program, the chances of ac accessing that funding obviously increases. And that is why we created the sport impact group, which was referenced earlier that um, I'm part of uh, to facilitate that transition and evolution. And now, as we reach the end of the, the presentation, the final uh, section here is designing sport uh, development programs. Maybe I should have said this in the beginning, one distinction is a, a semantic one, the word program and project. Uh, in this industry, they are often used uh, interchangeably. But as I was a formally trained project manager, and this was my job <laughs> at FIFA, uh, in terms of project managing the World Cup, actually program managing that portfolio, um, there is a difference in project management world the project management world between what is a program and what is a project. But for um, all intents and purposes today, we can consider them uh, more or less the same thing. So we're designing um, a program. What are some of the key success factors? Number one is intent. We talked about the objectives earlier, that there needs to be an objective, right? So when you are designing your programs, it needs to have an intention, right? It can't just be, um, I mean, it can just be play, but then that is the intent. If you're just facilitating recreational time, then that's it. But if you want to make a case that you are driving access, driving participation, improving performance, then you need to state that as your intent. 
number two. Um, the best programs are aligned to a bigger picture of some sorts, whether it's an organization's strategic plan or maybe it's the strategic plan or framework of a regional entity, a government entity, or an international one like FIFA or the ICC. Instead of operating your program on a silo or on an island, it gains much more power and relevance if it connects to uh, a bigger picture, right? And it allows you to engage other stakeholders. I would like you to pause for a moment and repeat that because I believe that a lot of the stakeholders here and also listening online where we operate in silo Many persons, either one, do not have a strategic plan, or two, do activities or ventures that they believe is for the greater good, but is not in line with development that the national governing body yeah. or the national sporting organization has for the development of the particular sport in the jurisdiction. Right. So um, I will repeat that, <laughs> that um, I can only reiterate the importance of this um, as I have worked with a governing body at international level. It's just so much easier when we receive proposals that are in line with stated strategic goals and objectives to just give that stamp of approval because everything's prepared. Even if you have an amazing project idea, which might get approved in the end, you create hurdles for yourself if it is, if it is not aligned, right? And you might shoot yourself in the foot if you're too far <laughs> uh, out of the box, so to speak, even with the best of intentions. So. Um, just understanding how organizations work and administrations work, the more you can align and engage, the better. On a practical level, for example, if you're looking for sponsorship, if you want to fund your development program, and if you have some sponsors in mind, let's say you have a telecom provider, or let's say you have an automotive company, or an oil and gas company, or an energy company, before you make that pitch to them, do your homework. Research each of those companies. What is their strategic plan? What is their intention? What do they want to do in Trinidad and Tobago or wherever you want to operate? What do they might even have a policy uh, or a strategy for sports sponsorship? And if you can use their language and if you can take their points and put it into your project and proposal, the chances of succeeding are exponential, right? And I can't tell you how many times people don't do that. So I think that was the point you wanted to stress. So do it. <laughs> Third point, um, your program must have a strategy or an approach. Uh, what is meant by that? Um, it's, it's one thing to say you want to drive participation, let's say, as an objective but how are you going to do that, right? That's the key question. If you want to drive performance, how, right? Whoever's going to fund this program project will want to know that. Why should we give you the funding or support, okay? And we'll unpack that a bit later. There needs to be a plan, monitoring of some form of monitoring, reporting, and evaluation. And then finally, closure and debrief. Sorry, I jumped the gun on the slides. <laughs> so we talked about intent already in depth, right? So we don't need to reiterate that. Ah, sorry, one thing here. If you say you're going to, to make, to impact an objective, let's call it participation. It's important to 
baseline where we are today and where we hope to be as a result of the program or the project, okay? Um, otherwise, whoever you're pitching this project to or program, they, they won't know what your hopes or intentions are as a result of the program or project. Um, we talked about the alignment and engagement already. On strategy and approach as well. We covered those points. Now in terms of plan, it's one thing for an organization to have a strategic plan, which tends to be high level and aspirational. Um, but the operational plan is key now when you make your project and program uh, proposals. Whereas the strategy might respond to the questions of what are we doing or why are we doing it, uh, the plan that you need to prepare for your programs addresses the how. How are we going to make this happen? Okay. And obviously, that needs to address the fundamental topics of time cost and resources and quality, right? Every project, I told you I was a project manager earlier, so bear with me. Every project is bound by these three constraints. You can't, uh, if you affect one, the other two are affected, okay? So if you want to build a stadium faster, you might need more resources or money or you might have to cut corners on the quality, right? Is that something you want to do or is that something your stakeholders will allow? Uh, you know, um, for a program, you know, if your program was designed for 100 participants, but you want to now expand to 500 participants, do you have the resources for that? Or is it a question of timing? Like if it was one weekend, can you do it now over two or three weekends, right? So these are the things you need to consider in the plan. Monitoring and reporting and evaluation. Um, definitely not the most fun topic that uh, I've encountered with project practitioners, but it's very important. It's important to, to understand where you stand with your projects, but more important than that, um, it might simply be uh, imposed upon the project by the stakeholders, whether it's a funding body that says, well, if you want the money, we need a report <laughs> every month or every quarter or whenever or when the project is done. Um, and it's also a matter of compliance as well. So a funding organization or supporting organization may have it as a requirement that there are reports from time to time to justify how the money has been spent and to demonstrate that, you know, if you said you were going to have a, a training camp for 50 girls, that you actually had a training camp for 50 girls, okay? And then finally, uh, that there should be um, a project closure. Um, this is also crucial and often skipped because this is the moment where you assess those final outcomes against what you hoped you would achieve. Did you achieve your goals? And it's also a moment to capture knowledge uh, for further additions, perhaps, of that same project. Hopefully, you took my advice earlier and you have a multi-year long-term uh, program in place and uh, you can learn from one addition to the next, similar to we, in the same way that we have multiple editions of this diploma. Um, or similar projects. So even if it's not exactly the same, but you're maybe dealing with similar stakeholders like uh, the same cities or the same sport clubs, right? Learning how to interact with them is crucial for the success of a project uh, and a program over time, okay? So we've reached time. We've gone over a few minutes, but we started a few minutes late, so I hope that's okay. Um, just to summarize here and recap, we talked about sport development and um, we gave it a definition. And that was, it is the intentional conducting of activities or initiatives 
to achieve specific developmental aims and objectives. Okay, intentional activities for specific aims and goals. We looked at the key objectives that sport development programs typically address. That was access, participation, performance, quality, and sustainability, okay? We then looked at what the emerging field of sport for development is, right? Which is the field or practice of achieving positive social or environmental impact, both with and through sport, and the relevance that sport for development programs can have for sport development programs. And then finally, we looked at how to design sport development programs or what those key success factors are. We looked at the importance of intent, alignment, strategy, or your approach. What makes your program different? Do you have a plan, right? The importance of monitoring, reporting, and evaluation, and the importance of closing and debriefing. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Any questions? Thank you. So, so we have a few minutes, right? Uh, for questions and answers? Oops, there's a big echo. Is that me? Um, either online or here in the room. Any here in questions? the room, any questions or answers, or, or questions? <laughs> Yes, just a moment. Uh, I'm curious to know, uh, in terms of uh, the Snow Sports Federation, uh, what are you, uh, how are you working on facilitating the access, participation, and sustainability of snow sports and especially in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Um, I might give it a start, but uh, I'll, I'll ask for our president's input as well. But um, from what I understand, we are in the process of elaborating a strategic plan. But um, one of the first focal areas is simply um, establishing the, uh, or getting the administrative house in order. And what does that mean? It means being recognized uh, by the relevant international bodies and having our athletes registered as athletes and informed about competition. Because uh, I can give you the concrete example of uh, an initiative we are doing right now. We have successfully registered uh, as a national federation under the International Ski and Snowboard Federation, FIS. It's the, the FIFA of ski and snow sport. So that is what has allowed me to compete as an athlete uh, in cross-country skiing, okay? And in the world championship. Trinidad and Tobago is not recognized yet as a federation or it does not have a federation in the International Biathlon Union, which is another federation, which you may, for those of you who are not aware, it's another winter sport which involves cross-country skiing, but also shooting targets with a rifle, okay? Even if I wanted to compete in that, or another Trini, uh, Trini Begonian, they could not because we are not recognized by the international body. So what we are prioritizing right now is getting recognized by the relevant international bodies and getting interested athletes aware that we exist, they can approach us, and they can also then get registered as athletes with athlete licenses as well. 
so they can practice the sport. So that's how we are um, trying to uh, drive access, basic access. Um, Hamish, was, is there anything you'd like to add to that? So uh, the TTSF is very small. It started quite a while ago, but um, it was largely not particularly active. It's only when certain athletes were interested in uh, potentially competing in more recent years that it was effectively reactivated and we really became involved. Um, so right now we have eight athletes uh, actually registered with uh, FIFA, uh, FIS, the International Ski Federation. But a lot of the work that we have had to do is putting, as I said, all the constitution in place, uh, all the policies, procedures, there's a huge amount of stuff that we have to put in place at the, uh, to, be, to satisfy FIS requirements as well as Prenat Big Olympic Committee requirements. So it's a much less glamorous side of things, but it's just writing a lot of policy documents, revising the constitution, um, getting this accepted, and making sure that everything's up to scratch. So but when we're starting, it's a lot of uh, legwork on that side. We have plans to uh, to roll out like a communication strategy through the, because all of our athletes are based internationally. There's no one in Trinidad, well, except Nick, who's there for a few days. But everybody's based abroad. So it's really, we will need to increase the numbers and that will be through word of mouth. So please tell anybody you know who is a Trinidad to make a citizen and is uh, interested, they can potentially compete to make internationally. Um, so we're looking at a communication strategy to try and recruit new members, whereby we, 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 we reach out through the diaspora in Toronto, London. There's lots of areas where we know there's a large Trinidadian population. Uh, so trying to contact uh, through those organizations to get the word out there. So that's some of the things we're trying to uh, focus on right now. Thanks, Hamish. Uh, any other questions, comments here or online? As regards to sport for development, there are online courses that persons can undertake, um, offered by UN, as well as uh, the Australian Development for Sport, so that you can be able to get more information to it, including how to be able to create sport development programs and policies that will assist. Thanks, and that is true. There's a, there are a few resources, uh, additional ones that I can highlight as well. The, the German uh, Development Agency, the GIZ, uh, also has a, a sport for development community, um, and I think some educational resources. And we at the Sport Impact Group, one of our members, uh, is also developing uh, an educational platform. Um, actually, it is developed, uh, an overview of what sport for development is in sustainable sport. Uh, so if anyone is interested, uh, you can approach me uh, afterwards or online. I can share that with you. Okay, any other questions or comments here? Yep. Thank you. Um, it's just a comment. Um, I work at the Football Association, and part of the presentation where it spoke to taking players from uh, playground to podium, it spoke directly to me because right now I'm in a bit of a conversation with our technical director about, I wouldn't say strong arming, but having players take part in C license, B license, as they go through the age groups going up towards um, the senior team. So seeing it there, um, for me personally, kind of made me think there, there's that, but then there's also the administrative side of it, but we should probably suggest that they try to get into more the clerical side of sport if they want to go into it deeper and pass their retirement as an athlete. Yes, um, a lot is, a lot of emphasis is placed on on that one pathway to, to podium and results, sporting results. But if I understood your comment, that we should highlight other pathways, right? Especially 
to the administrative world. And I guess that's this world here, right? So um, yes, absolutely. And that, that corresponds to the, if you remember in the presentation, this next generation of sport development programs that we're focusing on off the pitch, right? Uh, development. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Is there anything online? Okay. All right, then it seems that we've reached the end. Thank you very much for your attention and enthusiasm and questions. It's been a pleasure and uh, all the best for your careers. Take care.